as the darkness of the night sky was illumined with the radiance of God's glory, ushered in by a messenger from heaven. It was so overwhelming that it actually brought these tough blue-collar workers to their knees. As they trembled in the presence of greatness, they're not singing, oh, holy night. They're singing, oh, holy crap. Speaking into their deepest fears, the angel reassures them that he hasn't come with any bad intention in mind. Quite to the contrary, he's come with good news that will bring great joy, not just to them, but to everybody. But what kind of news could be good for everyone? As the story goes, it turns out that on that very night in the town of Bethlehem, that the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, had finally arrived. So many generations had come and gone with no sign of this promise being realized, but this was the night, and with the coming of Jesus, their fear simply had to go, because fear and joy cannot occupy the same space. They simply cannot hold hands. Now, before we go on, I think it's important to note that the very first people to witness the nativity, the shepherds, were regarded by most as kind of sketchy. They didn't have a very good reputation. They were suspect, and in a court of law, law their word meant nothing. And yet of all the people who could have been given an invitation to this most glorious event, it was the shepherds who were at the top of the guest list, which tells me this, that Christmas signals the end of any one group of people having any right to think that they are better than anyone else. To celebrate Christmas is to drive a stake through the heart of racism and sexism and classism and egotism. It's the end of thinking, oh, them? Christmas is to be the end of us versus them because now it is us with him. God in the flesh, here for us all, good news for everyone. And I think that's important for us not to miss. Now, when the angels brought this news to the shepherds about the birth of Jesus, they referred to him by using three different titles. I don't know whether you caught them or not, but let's just review they called him Savior, they called him Messiah, and they called him Lord. Let's consider the significance of each. Savior means, of course, one who rescues or who delivers. It's when you're in over your head and someone comes and throws the life raft and helps you from drowning. Now, for the people living in Israel that day, what they needed deliverance from was the oppression of the Roman government. They need a, a rescue from slavery. They needed a rescuer from oppression. They needed a rescuer. But I wonder tonight what it is that you and I might need a rescuer from. Sometimes, you know, we get anxious. We have these deep-seated fears that when <laughs> circumstances are right, they spring to the surface and they cause us to lose rest, to lose sleep, even to have panic attacks. And I wonder if in those moments, if the rescuer hasn't come to help us with our deep-seated fears, or maybe it's we need a deliverer from our addictions. You know, our addictions come in many shapes and sizes. And when they have mastery over us, when they are lording in our lives, we feel the pain of that slavery. Whatever it might be in your space this night, I wonder if the rescuer hasn't come to deliver you from your addiction. Maybe it's the pain of your past. Maybe it's something you just can't help but bring with you into your present. It's been like a weight that has been with you for far longer than you know how. And at this stage, you're not even sure whether or not you can get relief from it. You hope for it, but you wonder. And I wonder if the rescuer hasn't come to help you with something from your past. Maybe it's an unhealthy relationship that you don't know how to get out of. 
It's codependent, it's dysfunctional. It's, there's no wellness there. And you've been stuck in it and you're afraid. You don't know what to do. Maybe, maybe just maybe the rescuers come for you. What if the good news for all of us is that the way of Jesus is actually a way of deliverance from everyone and everything that seeks to oppress us. Well, the angel then uses the next title. The title is the Messiah or chosen one. It's the word for Christ. And that day when a new king would be appointed, the priest would come and drip oil on top of the future king's head. He would be called the anointed one or the Messiah, the one chosen to bring about a new kingdom. This, of course, would be bad news for the old king, in this case, Herod. But for everyone else who had lived under his oppression, it would be really, really good news. And then the angel uses the title Lord or Master. The word means the highest authority in any realm, including that of the emperor. When we call Jesus Savior, we're asking him to deliver us from our greatest problems. But when we call him Lord, we're submitting our lives. We are yielding our lives to him because we believe that he has a plan for our lives that is greater than the one we've devised for ourselves. Now, what happens next is interesting because the story moves from this information that the angel brings to an invitation. The shepherds are told this good news and then they're invited to witness it firsthand. But before they do, the first angel will be suddenly joined by an army of angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest peace on earth with those whom God is pleased. Glory to God and peace to you. Glory there and peace here. Not only did Jesus come to rescue us and lead us in a better way, he came to restore God's shalom, his peace on earth. And he invites each of us to share in it with him. But in order for that to happen, what our part is, is that we need to align our lives with everything that our master tells us to do. The reason so many of us so often lack peace has nothing to do with what's going on around us, but has everything to do with what is happening within us. We so desperately want the Prince of Peace to make his home with us, and yet we refuse to forgive those who've hurt us. We harbor at times anger and unresolved resentment. We make judgments and slander others with our words. And then we're somehow surprised that our bodies and our minds are breaking down. None of these actions are the way of the master because not one of them promotes shalom. How can we invite the light of the world to dawn upon our darkness if we have little to no intention of walking in it? How can we invite the Prince of Peace to rule and reign if we so consistently disregard those conditions that make for peace? If I entertain judgments against you, hold unforgiveness in my heart, say nasty things about you behind your back, or even worse, post them on Facebook for everyone to see, it all contributes to the disintegration and absence of shalom in my life. If we want peace, shalom, wellness, wholeness, harmony in our personal world, then every single thing that doesn't align itself with the master's instruction simply has to go. We all want peace in our world, but if we really hope to see it, then it must first live in us. And as it does, then we too can sing with the angels. All glory be to God for the great things he has done, first in us, and then through us. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful this night for the way in which you are constantly at work in our lives, even when we don't see it.
and especially when we don't feel it. This is a night where we celebrate the birth of a miracle, an unlikely miracle that comes to an unlikely people at an unlikely time. I dare say that there are many of us hoping for a miracle of some sort. We just ask in these moments that our eyes and our ears and our hearts would be opened to a rescuer, a deliverer, a Messiah, a Lord, who has our good intentions in mind and who seeks to lead us in a new and living way. I ask in these moments and in the moments to come that you would help us to see that which doesn't belong in our lives, that which does not lead to peace, that which is our joy, that which keeps us from your best. And you would give us the right just to come to terms with that and just to let those things go. And if it takes once or twice or a hundred times that we make it our aim to make you our Lord this night and every night. And as we do, we will remember that this would be the Christmas that something significant shifted in us, something changed, and that we would have received this miracle in a way that leads us towards our best life. And it's in the name of the Prince of Peace we pray this prayer. Amen.